Have you been scrolling through many, many, many film podcasts thinking there's far too many of these? Or have you been thinking there's something missing? There's something we're not quite getting. A waffler from Northern England reviewing films, for example. Welcome to oh, Review It Yourself. No politics, no pandering, no point. Welcome everybody, um, welcome to oh, Review It Yourself. Bit of a, um, a different one today, so we're not reviewing anything. And it's not even about a film, it's about a book. So if anything, we're previewing it, getting a bit of a sneak peek. Um, so I'm here with the author um, of the as yet unpublished book. Or I could say books, but I'll let him explain that. So uh, yeah. yeah, welcome Mo, if you just want to give an introduction of who you are. And uh... <laughs> Was that a poll or mint? Yeah, it was a poll. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, go on. Uh, do you want to give an explanation? Yeah, no, it's fine. Thanks for having me on again, Sean. Um, and uh, it's uh, it's good to actually talk about my unpublished, be published books. It's um, it's a passion that I have really more than anything else. It's um, an exploration of history in the different parts that I have a lot of interest in. Some of them, they're being cut out of history because there's so much mystery behind it. They don't even know. Um, what's happened. So they said, right, we'll just miss that part out and we'll move on. So my exploration into that, I thought, wow, there's so many stories in here, which would just be so interesting to know. And yeah, I had to encapsulate it somehow. And this is my attempt at reliving history. You know, uh, yeah, no, it's, so it's, it, uh, it, it reminds me um, what you were talking about with um, periods in history that aren't particularly well researched or people don't understand um why that so like for example if you look at british history and they call this period the dark ages it's not that that was a particularly backwards era where it went really savage or anything like that it was just the fact that like you said about what you look at there's so little documentary evidence left that Mm. the historians kind of go well we don't really know so we can only kind of guess and they only have time and all they get is from the archaeology which, as much as I love archaeology, it's a lot of guesswork. Well, you could argue it's almost all guesswork. Um, so, yeah, so for the people who would like to know, we're talking with uh, Mo. Uh, do you want to give your full name, Mo, just because I know it'll be on the front of the book, won't it? Uh, it's all right. Yeah, it's uh, Mohammed Eldorat, uh, but Mo is uh, n- nice and easy and snappy, so... Well for, the people, well, for the people who think I've been lazy and not using Mo's full name, I do actually, for once, I'm talking to a guest that I know in real life and I've met in real life, so I'm kind of... I guess you could let me off on that one. Uh, yeah. Mo's um, fictional historical novel is called The End of the Old World Powers, The Sea People. And if you'd like to give a, just a bit more of a taste of what it's about. Absolutely. So what we're looking at is um, really the lost history in between the ages of 1200 BC onwards, where we went into something called the Dark Ages. So at one point, the Egyptian Empire, the Hittites, the Greeks, they were all so powerful that they no longer needed to war with each other. So they made a great peace. Now, this peace lasted for about a few years, and all of a sudden, it just all broke loose. And at the same time, this is just after the fall of Troy, so I thought there's no better way of looking at history at just before all the evidence that we have absolutely drops off. And uh, as a result, not giving too much away, but as a result of these events that happened, we have notes of ancient civilizations saying, help us, uh, the people from the sea have come back. Uh, we need reinforcements as soon as possible. Now, these clay tablets, with which these messages were wrote on, never left the administration desks that they were wrote at. So just looking into that and exploring that's been such fascination and I hope people enjoy reading it as much as I've uh, enjoyed writing it. And I have shared a a copy with yourself, so I'm very keen to uh, see what you think as well. Yes, yeah. No, you know, that sounds like almost like the beginning of a film. I mean, I guess all films and things, not that I'm bringing about (laughs) films, but uh, get it to my wheelhouse. But I think with, with... it sounds like the beginning of a film. This like this desperate, these desperate messages arrive from you know all corners of, of uh, of different countries and things. I, I think that's fascinating, and yeah. I also love the idea of although I don't know. I mean, I'm very much a twentieth century 
type of story. I love, I love that you're looking at this this unique moment in time where this great piece ended, and it's almost. I mean, I don't know if you go into it, but it's that. What was the tipping point? I think history is always most interesting right on that precipice where we know what happened because we've got the benefit of hindsight and we're hundreds or thousands of years later. But at the same time, when you, when you look at these things through the documentary evidence, you think this could really have gone either way. That's what people think. It's like the second world war, which I know a lot about people think that that mm -hmm. was a certainty. It was always going to happen. Well, it wasn't, it was battled against. There was appeasement, which now everybody kind of looks back on and goes, Oh, that was really stupid. Well, it comes across that way now because unfortunately they were dealing with a, with a dictator who wanted what he wanted and nothing that anybody did, nothing that anybody tried to give him made any difference. But mm. yeah, as you said, Mo, you've shared with me the first chapter and also a little bit of uh, like your working progress of the second. And I just, I, I love the first, uh, the first chapter, just the way that, cause I, cause I wasn't sure when I first started reading it, what, um, whether it was like fictional or, but I guess I gather that it's, it's like a fictional tale, but told you've like quoted it in the, in the nonfiction. So you've got, because I, I guess from what you've said, that's really the only way you can do it because there's not enough effort. You couldn't try and go find somebody's name or where oh, they God, lived no. or anything. Oh yeah. The only evidence we have of names back then are great uh, rulers, generals, and anybody's names who's in the records as such and nothing else has really survived at all so absolutely um but yeah it's uh j just a point about the history as well history repeats itself you could argue in a sense that ramsey was like hitler for for an example in history the way and the things that they did yes they were civilized but at the same time they, they did some very questionable things and it was very military focused and military dominated as well and wars weren't wars that were just more political than anything else like why do you need poland like but why why do you need to take over syria like why yeah, like kadesh it doesn't it's just political so history repeats itself and by looking at what they did we can also look at we are what we are doing as well and the more further i go into the detail the it starts to become a bit worrying. It's like we haven't learned as humans like this, like since. No, we we, <laughs> we really haven't. I think. I mean, I think that history repeats itself. I think it. I think there's another quote that I quite like. I can't remember who did it, but it was, it was history doesn't doesn't repeat, but it sometimes rhymes. I like that explanation a little mm. bit better. Oh wow! In the it, I, know, I don't know where I got that from. I, I've read it somewhere. I, I always I, where, wherever I get something, I've read it. But um, yeah. Uh, they sometimes it rhymes and you get these and I think it was Churchill for whatever you think of him either way he is one of his famous quotes was to to look forward you just have to look further back just keep looking back at what's happened before and you'll pretty much figure out what happens in front and also I think a problem that all societies have and I don't just mean ours like this part like how the world is now I mean even the Egyptians I think that societies get to mm. this point where they think we're the most advanced, we're the most civilised, the most technologically advanced. We're not going to make the same mistakes that they made a uh, hundred years yep. ago, a thousand years ago. And yet, and we get wrapped up in everything that goes on and then we ultimately make the same mistakes. Like you talk about political wars. Well, not to get political about today, but you, I mean, you just have to look in the news, especially in this country. And there's, it's, that's, all, that's exactly what it's all about. The legacy of these, of wars that certain countries have gone into. And it's it's turned around to bite them because it's looked to be illegal or whatever else. Not to get too specific about it, but no, it's it's no, it's, it's right. Ex th 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 that's a beautiful example, but yeah, um, mm, yeah. So we'll move on, anyways. But yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's all right. We've kept it. Sure. We've kept it. Uh, what's it called? We've kept it general enough. The first question I really I really had for you, really, which is more of, more of a personal, question, not that personal question. Um, it was. <laughs> It was what first got you into this uh, this particular historical period? Cool. So my fascination is with um, ancient Greeks in Libya. So the ancient Greeks basically had too many people in land and the food wasn't growing. So they visited the Oracle of Delphi. And then she advised they went to North Africa, Libya in particular. And they didn't listen to her. And a few years later, nothing nothing happened. They went back to her. She said, you have to go there. 
So then they ended up migrating. This is about 600 BC-ish, 639, something like that. They went over there, they founded a settlement, they started growing. And now these guys, because they had more control of the sea, were able to deal with the Minoans, the Hittites, and the Mycenaeans back in Greece. And they formed a large contingent of power. And then they ended up going invading somewhere called Troy. <laughs> and Which people uh, may have heard of. Yeah. A terrible <laughs> to, to, Not to use the proper names, which I use in the book, but you're here to keep it simple. And uh, that war for 10 years bankrupted the empires. Absolutely bankrupted, emptied it. A lot of people lost their jobs, their livelihoods, natural disasters that are happening. There was tsunamis. This is all real events. Tsunamis came and uh, volcanoes erupted. So the, it just got worse and worse. And then by the time the soldiers had returned from Troy uh, to get back to the mainland, history just kind of disappears. And then that just hooked me. I said, I want to know more. So for about the past four or five years, I've just been studying it. Then the past year, I've come in to start writing it. So um, yeah, that, that's what got me into it. No, yeah, no, it's, it's 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 a good answer, and I think you you describe it in such a wonderful way that it makes you kind of go, yeah, it does sound really interesting because there's always that fascination of the unknown mm. with, with with human beings. I think we always want to if something if we don't have an answer to something, we want to find out why. We don't like mysteries. We don't like when we don't get the answers to things. Because I think if you get the answer to something or an agreed answer, then everybody can kind of, you can deal with it and get on with it. But when something happens mm -hmm. and you don't know why it what caused it or you don't know what the reasons are, that frightens people. I don't think they like it. Uh, not to get too like psychological, but I don't think, because yeah. it, it's, it's, it's discomforting. True. They don't know what to, mm -hmm. but I, I think that's fascinating. Um, I always see as a, when I when I did history at uni, I always kept to the 20th century. I mean, I do enjoy doing it because there's some very interesting wars in that period. But I also think that there's a lot of there's a lot of documentary evidence. So for a historian, it's very, very easy to do. It's not easy. There's yeah. lots to go through. But it's not like I had friends who did, you know, they went further back and did more like the Dark Ages, which you've been looking at. And you end up writing like an essay on, on or an assignment on on like three pieces of evidence, like yeah, you know, two doc, two secondary books that someone's written, uh, like mm -hmm. yourself with these that are very very that are quite niche, um, because mm -hmm. they're difficult to do. So I, I do I do uh, take my hat off to you in respect of going to, to write about something. It's very 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 difficult to to research. But in that, I suppose you you've then got a little bit of freedom where you can say right well. I could, this is where I can weave the, the fiction into it almost. That's where the creativity comes into play. And we just say, what are the after effects? What are the five most likely things that would have happened from this being a cause? And then breaking that down based on what would have happened during that era. What was the common norm and the go-to thing that they would do and the tools that they would use and so forth. But then those tools, that language that intelligence almost all disappeared. And then we went into the dark ages as we know it. So it's that massive disconnect from being so civilized to having bronze and ornaments and so on and so forth to nothing. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting period. I know, I mean, I know it's a little bit. So Romans would be before this, right? After, after. after. A oh, long okay. time after. Right, okay, ignore me. Yeah. <laughs> but no, but it is, it is this, just in terms of like this is me again with the British history um apologies to the rest of the world but in terms of when the Romans came here we've got you know villas with um bathhouses and um, underground central heating technologies that wouldn't be seen again for hundreds of years and you, you look at it and think well how did you how did you forget that I know in terms of it's yeah. funny we talk about the dark ages I know you're looking at, at Libya and North Africa but in terms of uh, in terms of British history in the Dark Ages, there's an argument between historians now that, well, actually, it's not that it did. It's I mean, I don't know about where you're looking at, but th there's an argument. Some historians say that the Middle Ages, uh, not the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. Sorry, it's not that they were dark or the civilization went backwards in any way, and people. It was just that the recording processes or the administration, if you will, 
which is maybe what happened in, in, in Libya and those, but maybe the administrations stopped doing what they were doing because it was war or famine or because of disasters. Mm. All that, that kind of social hierarchy fell apart. So people just got on with it. And I think possibly that, that might be what happened. I mean, it, maybe it didn't become uncivilised. Oh, maybe it did. I don't know. I mean, you're the guy looking at this stuff, not me. So I'll shut up. No, that, that's a great point as well, because um, it was later on with the Assyrians um, in like the age of power, they, they called them the gods of war. They were the first people to invent like army tanks and battling rams that could like hammer down walls and stuff, forget the horse. These guys were way, way more advanced for their time than any of the armies were for like until the Romans probably. Um, probably one of the largest empires ever. Uh, in that in region for their time. So was it Assyrian. the as the Assyrian Empire? Is that what what the empire was, would have been called? Um, that that they were the vacuum cause of the events that took place. Now, to say the collapse of the of the Bronze Age was simply down to um, people like the Sea People invading. That wasn't the only cause. There were like a lot of you know things that were contributing, fa contributing factors yeah massive contributing factors on all scales and all levels which has been ignored 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 and then a boiling point came from a mass um immigration and then um in other parts mass migration caused an opposite effect yeah and uh both places suffered from an influx again it's very scary that you can see a common uh, in in the modern day to back then and how things you know very uh, interchangeable. Yeah, yeah, um, those parallels that you can you can draw between what's happening back then and what's happening now. You'd think that now, because of governments and United Nations and all these kind of UNICEF and all these different organisations, that it would be easier to get things sorted than it would have been back then. Mm. But I mean that, that's another argument to be had. But no, it is interesting that I love. Oh. I'm, I'm just just in my my personal I love to watch kind of documentaries I love learning about human disasters I've never been a massive mm. natural disasters person but human disasters or man-made disasters I, I find absolutely fascinating although I love Pompeii who doesn't um and it is somewhere yeah. I definitely want to go uh, at some point but I love looking at um they had a lot of notice they had a lot of notice. <laughs> yeah, but they, did, they didn't even have a word for, for volcanoes. They just called them fire mountains, and they only knew of Etna, so they didn't they didn't know. They just got earth tremors and put it down to the gods' anger and that kind of thing. Because volcano comes from Vulcan, where they the god. Mm. Um, yeah. His anger and all that, all that kind of thing. But, but yes, yeah, so I got actually, I get sidetracked. No, it's, it's, yeah, um, it's I, I, I like looking at when you look at disasters. Mm. Um, there's always, especially man-made ones but also natural as well there's always so many steps there's this sequence of events and all these dominoes have to fall at just the right time and then you throw in a famine or you throw in a migration or you throw in an exodus um because as you were saying you'll get a vacuum in what so if everybody leaves one part of the world you get a vacuum of there's not enough people to run the services and all that I kind of thing yeah. and then in the other uh, extreme where everybody migrates to you end up with services becoming stretched and then all that kind of thing. So, yeah, it is, it's a fascinating um, fascinating thing to, to think about. And I think the book, from what, just from the introduction, I, the chapter one that I've read and the chapter two, I, I, I'm really interested to see where they go. I mean, I, I know I said when I read the, the first chapter, I, I gave some notes back that was just, I loved the description. I think this is something that people really enjoy. The description of so it starts off not i'm not spoiling it well it's not a spoiler it's just it starts off on a boat so I, won't, right? I won't give you any more information than that to the people listening but it starts off on a boat and you meet the men on the boat the commander in it but really you know you don't you learn basically you don't learn names or anything like that but you do learn what the hierarchy is very very quickly and who's in charge and what they're going for and what they're up to and you've got these beautiful descriptions of of the waves and the men working in unison and I love that part of it. And I was, and by the end of the chapter, I was like, yeah, this, this is, this has hooked me in. Um, so mm. I'm almost, I'm almost disappointed. There isn't a full book that I can be like, send me the rest, send me the rest. Um, <laughs> so I, I look forward to it. I, I do look forward to it. And I think it's, it's something that, um, 
that will do well. So the next, the next, um, oh, to be fair, we've already answered that one. The next one was, do you think there's a gap? But we've already talked about that one. Mm-hmm. Also, it was, what are your dreams for the book? So where, where is it at now in terms of getting it published and, and what, what kind of journey have you been on since you started, started doing it? So is, um, right. so are you looking to kind of, for this podcast to bring a bit of awareness or, um, so yeah, just, Whatever your feelings are on that one. Yeah, so to be <laughs> honest, uh, since a young age, since about since I can remember to write and draw, I've been writing stories about like history, Romans, and different you know series about Romans. Just like a four piece of paper, four or five of them folded up to write myself little books. And now, as I've got older, I've got this uh, passion where I, I write you know massive things on research, but then put them into a novel, and I thought. Hey, um, I'll just share these with people and I'll see what they think. And then people really enjoyed them and um, worked on them a bit more, refined them, so on and so forth. And and now it's just a case of whoever enjoys history and they enjoy, you know, the style of writing that I use. I'd I'd love for them to uh, to just enjoy the book and just to find history themselves. Um, the way I fell in love with it, I'm a it, wherever it goes, it goes. But end of the day, for me, it's just sharing my passion of history of people. It's really just a um, digital copy that I'll be selling. So I don't want to get involved with malarkey and paperwork and so on. I do enough of that already. Yeah, um, that makes sense. Yeah, so it's it's just my own thing. I was thinking about doing it just a, uh, a pound a chapter at a time and then be releasing it every few months. And, and that's what I'm going to do because I want people to enjoy it and read it without a hassle. So a chapter at a time gets you to appreciate that until the next part comes out. And uh, yeah, so almost like, you're, almost like you see realizing it in a way, um, like a novella. Mm-hmm. So you'll cut it in a small part. Absolutely. So then you can do your own research and go away and then come back. And because there's no concrete conclusion, there's actually no spoilers out there. So uh, that's what makes it even more interesting. Yeah, I mean, if nothing else, it'll generate conversations because there'll be people who are really, really with the way you go with it. And then mm. there'll be others who are kind of, um, who will be like, well, I, I don't think it would have gone that way. But but in that, you'll get that wonderful conversation. And if that's for, for an unknown part of history, that that's all you want, really. You want people to come back and say, oh, I wasn't sure about this. I didn't know about that. Um, is, are there any just because I, I mean i did history before and it would be something that i'd want to know if i was listening and interested in i am interested but if people are really interested in this but like yourself are there any particular authors uh, i should have asked you this before but are there any particular authors or any books that you'd recommend people go to and i know you say there's not a lot of documentary evidence so maybe that's a bit of a hard question um i'll provide some links that you can put in the description i think that might be easier than yeah that's a good idea rolling through them but i do have an archaeologist who's uh, a big inspiration of mine um he's called uh, john anthony west i'm not sure if you've heard of him but um he was no, an not. ancient uh, egyptian archaeologist and uh, he was the one who found that the sphinx had been immersed in water for hundreds of years from a great flood that took place so the sphinx predates the pyramids by a long time well, I never and knew that. Just, yeah, just things like that. I'll send is that, you the link is that why that it's well. oh that explains so much? That's why it's like um like if you throw a sharp rock in the sea and it comes mm. out of the sea after so many years and it's all smoothed off. That makes so Basically. much sense. I've never known that. I never knew that. Yeah. That's I'm like, you know what you're like almost disappointed in yourself. Like, I never knew that. That's fascinating. No, yeah. But the amount so, of times um, I've I've read about the pyramids, because I mean just through watching films that, that I like, The Mummy and things that I love, I've read about ancient Egypt and, I, and I've watched o- other documentaries about like the Aztecs and the Incas, other, other civilizations that had pyramids and had this technology that wouldn't be seen again for years. Mm. I didn't know that. I want to find out about that. Yeah, so he also was, um, just before he died, God rest his soul, um, he was very interested in the sea people in exactly what I'm doing now. And he unfortunately didn't get to finish it. Um, so in a way, this is like almost a tribute from me to him 
you know, when somebody's inspired you to get into the field of study and just for him to talk about wanting to do something on the Joe Rogan's podcast. And then I looked into it and he was early because this is all interchangeable from ancient Egypt. Like ancient Egypt was the only people to defeat this, these invaders twice consecutively. And then were the only ancient power to last. So you've got four major powers, three have gone, one's left. And that was the decline of the new uh, empire. And then you had the Greeks and, you know, the Persians, obviously, that came through. So then Egypt just kind of fell. They weren't really much. They weren't a power like they used to be. And then later on after that, that's when you have, uh, you know, a bit more of the migration. And then that's where they say Rome was founded from uh, the descendants of Troy. So they think that sea people were being pushed around even after they had settled. And then that's when they ended up back in Europe. Um, with the great migration of people uh, invading the, new, the Etruscans in Italy and the Italian states and the Greek states that were there, and then ended up kicking them out and forming the Roman Empire. So uh, it, that's where it all comes from. That's it's fascinating. It's it's a part of history that I, I've never really gotten into. It is something I, I probably need to need need to have a bit of a, a bit of a closer look at. But like you said, it's just it's such a such a complex part of history. It's an enjoyable one as well as complex. That's the beautiful thing about it. I know, but it's always butchered though. Like not to bring <laughs> it back to films more, but honestly, like when you the amount of films that have been made about that, uh, about the ancient, you know, the ancient civilizations, uh, if that's what they considered as, you 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 look at, you know, I mean, you get these just these god awful films, you know, like, and you think, why, what, what were you thinking, like that? Like you'll probably say, there's much more interesting things in the true events of what happened than going away and making something up yourself. I've never, I've never understood that. Maybe it's because it's so expensive to do. I don't know. Maybe it's because it's so well, hard to to show those kind of like those kind of civilizations now without using like God knows how many million pounds of uh, of, of CGI and all that kind of thing. To be fair, though, the older films in the oh god i don't know when 60s 70s whatever when they'd have like a thousand men on a battlefield all dressed up and they'd all be fight them films look so much better than our CGI. Oh, yeah yeah you're talking about kind of no. the ben hers and you go into spartacus and all those kind of things because they couldn't, yes they couldn't make them any other way there's no way of doing it so they mm. had to make it with people they couldn't they couldn't like cheat it or make any of it up um not not uh, you get like anthony and cleopatra and all those kind of things but no, this is quite a fascinating part of uh, part of history that you're going to look at. So oh, I'll, I'll... Another, yeah, sorry, go on. Just another fun fact for you. So you know Cleopatra, she's actually a descendant of one of Alexander's generals called Ptolemy. So she actually isn't even Egyptian; she's Macedonian. Yeah, yeah, it's <laughs> pretty, pretty much like all the saints of England. I don't know if any of them are English. <laughs> I really don't. It's um, it's very, um, very, yeah, uh, it's very, very odd. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it's interesting that, but like, and then you see where things are just highlighted in certain places, following certain bloodlines, and you're like, oh wow, it's all actually like just based on Alexander the Great. This is very interesting, you know. Yeah. So he went a bit right. crazy. He went a bit crazy though. He, he renamed like everywhere after himself, didn't he? So he went a little bit. He went a little. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I think I'll call this one Alexander as well. Great choice. Well guessed, sir. I, mean, I know, but then you try it as a historian. It's like, right, which one is this? Is it the one over there? Is it the one over there? Is it the one? Uh, it reminds me what um what was it's it? Like, it? Was it Alexander who said um he looked at he looked at a map of his conquest and weeped for there were no more worlds to conquer? Is that that's Alexander the Great, isn't it? Yeah. For some reason that's... I've been I've been reading about him recently. I can't remember why. But yeah, uh, he's a big one of mine like I uh, I study him a lot as well very interested in uh, one day visiting where his tomb is and like he visited Achilles tombs and just all these places of fallen you know like um, fallen figures uh, it, it, it'd be beautiful just to visit you know them and no oh, absolutely it's it's always um, interesting to go back and to, to, to visit these places because you can only you can only take in so much from reading and then when you actually go to these places it's like when i went when i went to dover uh, a few years ago to 
with a few friends to try and swim the channel. Uh, we got halfway mm. there. Um, and yeah. when oh, I nice. and I'd never been so close, to, I'd never been that far south before. And when I stood like on Dover Beach, and they're not really like the beaches like we are, they're just pebbles and stones. They're awful to stand oh, on. Oh wow! But anyway, you you you've got to wear like sandals while you hurt your feet. So I was looking, and I never realised you could see France from England. I had no idea that you can oh, literally wow. see France in the distance. It's, it's it's right there, and their cliffs are white as well because you know the land mass has moved, and it it made me think about you know the Second World War. And the fact of how frightened people were in, in England and the UK, well, Great Britain, that 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 Hitler and the, and the Nazis were going to keep on coming. And I thought, it's no wonder, because they were literally right there. They were right yeah. just over this tiny 19 miles of sea. But it's it's that it's that little land of, you know, it's that little little trench of water that managed, managed to keep us keep us safe. In a, and from Napoleon, you want to go back to other people, Napoleon tried to Try to invade. Point. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it's it's fascinating how history has these these little rhyming these beats. It's almost like um, it's like the, you know the same song but different lyrics or slightly different. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Um, but I I hope it uh, it all goes well for you. I'm sure it will. Um, Thank you. I think we'll we'll have another episode where you're going to come back and talk about your second book. <laughs> Yeah, we'll discuss that one then. It's a, it, it's a door of fascination in itself. So I, I we'll keep it close for now. We'll focus. So yeah, we'll one. leave it on a cliffhanger for the for the people there. But um, yeah, um, thank you more for coming on. I've I've really enjoyed the, sure. I've really enjoyed the chat, and I could go on all day with history. Well, you know me, so you know what I'm like with history. But it's 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 a fascinating thing to look at, and I think you've definitely cornered this like really interesting because when it's so like you when you explain it to me like that you want to know more it's that like fascination i want to know more about that it's like i'm you better believe the minute this finishes i'll be going and be like was the sphinx underwater i'll be like i want to find out what happened there <laughs> how have i not how have i not known that i'm like disappointed i didn't know it but, yeah uh, i'll provide it I'll provide a few links to some interesting things about the sea people, about that history, and then some links to like some uh, to, so, some other really interesting stuff. So there's stuff people can take away and learn as well, as well as yourself. You know? Yeah, fantastic. I'll, uh, so for anybody listening, they'll be linked in the description box um, wherever you're listening to it. Uh, so thank you to Mo for joining me. And you can review this podcast on Podchaser. We're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. We're on Good Pods, we're on Apple, we're on Google, we're all over the place. Um, so anywhere you hear it, if you want to leave a little rating, you can also rate on Spotify now. So if you want to do it on there, you can do. Um, thanks to Mo for coming on. I hope people have enjoyed this. I'll put some links in. And um, yeah, just before we go, can I tempt you to just give me like one line of what the second book's about? Oh, okay. Um, go on then. So it's basically... During the Middle Ages, in the medieval time, there were a people called the Order of the Night Templars. And just before they were established and they came, there was an ancient Arab order, which used to operate um, on a very small number against a very large enemy. And then they used some very interesting tactics to stay alive. Uh, people know them as... Uh, Nazari Ismailis, others know them as the Hashashini, but most common people know them as the assassins, like from Assassin's Creed, what's that based off? But this is the true story about them. That is a good teaser. <laughs> that really is. Oh, pleasure, man. I'll tell you what, oh, like, you... we can't top that. We'll uh, we'll finish it there. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you more for joining me. I've, Thank I've you really enjoyed myself. Oh, anytime, man. Anytime. Thank you. Deep in the dark beating heart of Cairo, the year unknown. Talk of invasion to the Holy Land is on the tip of everyone's tongue. No one knows who to believe. The trouble with times like these are, the truth is in plain sight. Although people like to speculate and drag topics into conspiracies, as it's always easier to talk about a problem than it is to solve it. 
In the late hours of the night, a gathering takes place in Dar al Aswad, the house of blackness. A shisha bar which offers a place to talk and relax, to forbidden stories and tales of ancient times past, by a mysterious, shunned old man of knowledge. A group of young men sat around. The smells and scents of their shisha pipe relaxed them, as their minds drift far and beyond this dimension, in a haze of whispery streaks of silver escaping into the midnight air. The old man is sat in the centre of the room. He is blind old and very frail, his clothing tattered and torn, as the wear and tear of life can be read like a map leading to the soul. The room was an outer garden based in the centre of the inn, the walls white, dressed in scaling ivy and decorated with Arabic scripture, poetry and writing quotes of the age in gold, giving grandeur to this humble abode.